Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where today's most exciting solopreneurs share their startup stories. They also deliver tangible strategies that they would implement personally if starting their business over today. Each episode is a startup masterclass. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. This is Kevin Pruitt with another episode of Rising Tide Startups, and my special guest today is James Giancotti. James, thank you for joining us all the way from the other side of the United States in San Francisco. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, actually, I'm looking at the background here. I'm a little jealous of your like space age <laughs> <laughs> office setup, and people are going to have to watch YouTube to see what I'm talking about. But I mean, it's like I'm talking to James, and he's in a like a VR. <laughs> virtual reality so, this is not this is not a virtual background I can yeah, tell you. that is the um, real deal That's this right. is a real deal i i i uh this is my former life as a banker where i needed as many screens as i can to look at charts <laughs> you got some um, like he has to be in a separate place and you know, email here and calendar there and charts exactly. there excel there yeah um, that's typically how I roll, yeah. I, I mean, I think you you got some, like you're creating an EV vehicle or something out there on a, in a box <laughs> there behind you or something. Yeah, it's like you're building your own TV set or something, but it's- Well, you know, I, it's, do, I do live in Silicon Valley, so, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> where I, else I would you be? With the times. Yeah. <laughs> where else would you be? So, hey, why don't you just take a minute and just introduce yourself just like we would have met at a networking event. How would you introduce you to, yourself to us? You know, I haven't done a networking event in a while, probably because of COVID, but... Hey, it's VR I'm, time, you know, <laughs> virtual reality, just imagine yourself there. Yeah, that takes a while now, <laughs> uh, two years. But anyway, let me get started. I'm James Shankotti. I'm the co-founder of Otup. Um, I run a company that rates startups and rates cryptocurrencies. Uh, that's as simple as can be. Many people compared us to the Moody's of startups, where we look at a company rate it on its value, I, if it's a 1 to 100, 100 being wonderful, 0 being terrible, and give it a score on the health of the company every single day, an evaluation on the company every single day. And we've got customers throughout the world. We started our journey in a small little city called Hong Kong, and then moved uh, to the other sides of the world and uh, grown from a two uh, founder team to now um, uh, heaps of people across the world in different ge geographies all working from home and doing amazing things. So I don't know in, in 250 odd episodes or whatever, I don't know that I've ever had so many questions generated by somebody's quick intro that I, than I have today. <laughs> so I'm, so we rate startups and cryptocurrency. So I'm, yes, I can't imagine like, I had 50 questions go through my mind immediately based on what you said. So I would imagine you're, you always like, you're like a sports referee. You always have somebody that's upset with you on the rating that yeah, you we, we, we always have someone who's upset with us, but not necessarily for the reasons you think. It's usually because our recommendation was right and they're upset that they didn't take it. Um, at the start, when we first started on, we thought, oh, people are going to hate us. We're giving bad ratings and, and so forth. Um, we actually get a lot of thanks from a lot of people because, you know, one of the things we've learned along the journey is that, you know, we can give a rating, but it's up to the investor to decide for themselves. Yeah. Uh, we have many people come back and go, well, your rating was poor. We invested in the company, the company failed. So we should listen to you. So the anger is sort of slightly directed at us, not directed at us. We sort of, we go, okay, well, yeah, that's what we're here for. Um, startups typically uh, don't get upset. They want to prove us wrong. And we love that because we're startups as well. We understand that we, we want to do it. Um, but, you know, we're a data, data information website. So, you know, you can use us along with all the other uh, people in our space to sort of put their, put your own picture on what you think is the right thing for your investment decisions or your data decisions or the sales decisions. And that's where we, we come out. See, I, I, I mean, it's interesting because I, I was thinking more of the latter. Like I, I would have think that the startup founders were the ones that are going to be, I'm upset with him because you, you know, you're going to affect how I can raise money. You're going to affect how I can, you know, build a team, that type of thing. But it's really interesting. I, I love the idea that they take it as a challenge, you know, that it's like, and, you know, we will so prove you should. wrong. And so they should. So, so yeah. one of the things we did to avoid that was at the start, we actually had almost every single startup we could find on the platform. But some of these startups were like pre six months, they were mm -hmm. not even a website. And, and they were a lot of them are destined to fail, because yep. it's sort of like, I'm going to do this, and then you don't do it. And so typically, we have companies that have raised a little bit of capital, they've gone through the an accelerator, or at least got themselves to a pre seed stage. 
huge because then they've actually got a working product. But previously, when we first started off, we had everyone and the dog and every single founder there. And that actually created more stress for us. One, because the data wasn't there. And two, these companies tended to fail. And so their ratings were ten tended to be worse. So once they've got a bit of capital, once they've got a bit of a working product, some 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 data we can pull from, we actually include them to odd up. So that's how we've changed. And there's actually less people that get upset with us. Actually, most people don't get upset with us because we don't really sell to founders. We sell to corporates who are right. looking to invest in yeah. startups. And it's interesting, this, just the similarities between startups and crypto. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I mean that because a, a cryptocurrency in essence is is almost a startup in itself, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, in many, many ways. So are there certain like minimum thresholds? I mean, you kind of touched about it, you know, kind of roughly, but are there certain, you know, set minimum thresholds that a startup has to meet to be able to to be on the platform? Yeah, so typically they need a, a website and a working product, um, at least something to work off. Um, Any revenue? Any... Uh, revenue is, you know, revenue is a very delicate word here in San Francisco. Revenue, even if you're making revenue, you're looking bad. You need to be, you need to be poor, 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 and then go IPO, and then great, I'm making money now. So that's exactly. typically the, the path to funding versus, um, the, you know, this whole little. You know, work that we do here that looks like a triangle that goes, you know, high up the food chain. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, VCs invested in companies and revenue is not a key. So, you know, I digress, but the focus of us is to get a product, uh, to get a, a startup that's actually got a product or got some form of product, some advisors, a little bit of capital, and is actually building something. The mm -hmm. good thing with the crypto companies, as you mentioned, is usually that's a very fast allocation, very fast. And so you're actually, you know, got a product that's already on odd up. But, you know, they're still in that development stages, whereas the startups are usually we've got a product, we've got a team, we've launched in a certain city and we're building something. So you can actually measure their their progress. And so um, that's helped put that helps put uh, a much better rating. And the one thing that we always say for startups, if they want a better rating is actually, you know, do more, build more. <laughs> Mm -hmm. do something you know because the less you do the worse your rating is going to be because there's more risk right you know we're, we're looking at risk more than anything else um the more revenue you get of course there's less risk and you know more expense uh, these are, it's all about we're a risk management platform in that sense that mm. for an investor is going well we've got more information about this company there's less risk so that we always ask the startups to get to a, a certain stage where they're you know at least there's something to do something mm -hmm. to download something to buy something to interact with where there's a product to at least work well from i mean it's almost like you're you're a due diligence service for investors you know it sounds like i mean that's it's it's kind of a, it's, it's a maybe a poor comparison but you know for a for a buyer of a company or whatever but you're you're almost trying to to do you know the research so investors can make intelligent decisions based on you know the whatever they're looking to invest in is that is that a fair comparison? Part of a fair comparison. We found that over the years. So at the start, we wanted to be that analyst for a VC firm. That was what the intention mm -hmm. of what was. And what we found is that um, VCs have their own egos, have their own methods, have their <laughs> own uh, quotas. They have everything to do with it. You know, most of the time they spend their gut on, <laughs> on their twenty percent, they're two and twenty. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the, the most of the time, and, and besides being on Twitter, trying to become a social brand, I mean, VCs have their own, their own method. And we've actually found that VCs usually want that analyst because it's take, taking that work away from them so they can mm. just uh, allocate the decision. What we are is one of uh, a, you know, a data source of what our recommendations are. Ultimately, they're going to make their best assumption on their investment based on, you know, their, their funds uh, quota, their funds, you know, needs to deliver um you know certain returns companies that they like if it's in a certain industry um but vc is actually not our main customer our main mm. customer is corporate so what we find is a lot and for m a transaction and sales so we've actually found there's a lot of our customers are more interested in the data of going okay who's raised money and how how and good example is uh, cloud services that use us to ultimately on sell to um, startups so look at a startup that's raised some capital you know and then look at their risk assessment if our risk assessment is good meaning this company is going in the right direction they're more willing to give some freebies which usually happens in silicon valley in order to get people on the platform um, because the little secret known that people most people don't know in silicon valley is that um, 
you know, it's it's startups buying from startups in, in and services mm. within services. So it's more about trying to on sell that as well. So that's where our platform helps the corporates and also from the higher corporates like your Thomson Reuters, Bloomberg. They're looking primarily at the data, the risk mm-hmm. assessment data, particularly if corporates are looking at you know M and A um, opportunities. Early stage companies sometimes are really really good um, talent to acquire if you're a big company and you want a certain space or a niche space and want to acquire some talent. So the let's let's talk about the platform itself a little bit. Is there is there kind of like you know I mean I'm, I'm going to dumb this down for my layman's mind, but let's say you've got 15 key metrics that you're measuring. Is it is it kind of the here's the algorithm and we're going to put everybody through the algorithm and it's going to shoot out a like their net promoter score you know type thing on the on the back end. They're going to have a I mean like you said from zero to 100, you know it's it's we're measuring everyone using the same factors and it's kind of a fair comparison across the board or what's the what's kind of the meat and potatoes behind the the idea so part of that is correct and the other part of it let me add i'm I'm pretty good about getting about 30 percent there on this interview so far you know (laughs) i'm glad you can put the rest of pieces together yeah (laughs) well so so let let's maybe the first part of uh the correction is certain types of companies through the same methodology mm, yeah um, but, uh, i use hardware as an example so let's say you're going to build a new um, smart watch um, now if you're building a smart watch and you're doing that from chicago have you got a, 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 a have you got a better chance of deploying that versus in shenzhen china mm. or in silicon valley and so it, we look at the metrics of a company of ultimately you know how successful can they be in a certain geography yeah. in a certain industry so i blockchain last year was everything in the dog nfts etc this year maybe not so much and so each industry gets evaluated in a startup in an industry and also each location so if you're a, and so i go back to the hardware example if you're that hardware company in chicago sydney london or shenzhen now based on um, you know, just the obvious thing is that you, you would think that being in Shenzhen will give you an advantage and it gives you more of an advantage than let's say Chicago. However, there could be some key clients that you're selling to in Chicago that could be better than Shenzhen because you've for got sure, that sort of handover. So there's things that we look at and we look at every part of it from um, who the investors in in the company, uh, who the founders are, have they had previous success before? They're also the age of the founders. Typically, we find mm-hmm. that founders over the age of 30, even sometimes over 40 and 50, are much more successful than the early stage founders purely because of stress running a company um, uh, or uh, having having that previous experience in an industry really helps completely. Location is key, um, as well as you know other metrics such as sub, sub industry uh, and and, and also uh, movements of market IPO mm-hmm. comparison. So good example, if you're doing a B2C company and um, uh, let's say Zoom, for instance, yeah. um, and you're doing a Zoom competitor and you can see ultimately if if the space is saturated from a public perspe- public markets perspective versus a private markets perspective and who would potentially acquire that. Um, so all these things go into the platform to try and give a rating. And so we're looking at both the public and the private markets, uh, as well as location investors, founders. We're looking at everything to give that score. So it's not a one size fits all because right. then you're going to get really wrong ratings. It has to be based on you know where you know location and industry are the very good subsets of both of those. It, it, the way you describe that, though, it, it sounds like to me that you guys have have, got, have to work really hard at the difference between the objective and the subjective. So, mm-hmm. you know, objectively, you can have your your metrics across the board, even if it's, you know, by industry. But then you said, you know, we consider a lot of things, you know, like who are the investors? When, you know, what's the location? What's the supply chain? What's the what are the political factors, you know, in in a location, you know, in the the government bureaucracy or whatever you know they're facing what's the market the market or what are the markets doing around that so i would think that that uh you know you would really have to fight almost the subjectivity you know of the ratings too big you know based on just the innumerable variables that you could you could bring to bear you know in looking at a company so how do you kind of balance those things and and does it just get smarter you know, the more you use, like, it's like smart technology, just kind of, you know, it's like AI, it just gets smarter and smarter, the more you the more data that you have, and, and the more you've used it type thing. So that's kind of a three or four questions kind of crammed into one there. 
I'll try and answer each of them. But uh, <laughs> the essence is basically, you know, is the platform getting smarter and smarter with more of the data? Um, and, you know, do you take the emotion out? So the short answer is we don't have emotion. And this is me being a previous investment banker. The charts tell the story. Mm-hmm. And the charts are just numbers and the charts are just data. Now, I, it's not about is this founder better off because they've got a bigger Twitter profile. It's none of that stuff. It's more about, um, you know, is this is the data that's what we're presented with on this company is it pointing to a success or is it pointing to concern is it pointing to high risk Mm. and so that's where we look at data and that's one of the things that separates particularly you know when people are making decisions if it's you know fear of missing out fomo for it's you know Mm -hmm. high um you know high conviction beta you know we just we cancel all of that it's all about the data and getting that data where it needs to be which is the best data possible to give the uh, the best best answer, and so a lot of our platform has been very much focused on getting, you know, that algorithm to an AI perspective. And I'm not going to go through the technicalities of that because my tech team will do a better job than I am. But you know, it, but in essence, <laughs> that's it, why you're the boss. <laughs> it, it, I have it, people that do that. And, and and just spend time talking to you. That's that's exactly <laughs> what my job should be. Exactly. Um, uh, but it, it's more about getting, you know, looking at getting a system that I can actually take more input in. And so one of the things that worked over the years is actually building intelligent systems. And I won't talk about the technology aspects, but building intelligent systems to basically keep on adding more information to it. Yep. We've rebuilt that platform. I think this version seven that we've built on, which just released a new platform uh, because technology's changed, you know, data's changed. And we've, you know, we've had to roll out, you know, every year, every 18 months, trying to get it better and better and better and faster and better and better because Ultimately, there's more and more data coming in and we're, mm-hmm. we're against the clock of the data. There's startups getting formed every minute and we need to be on top of that. And now because we're not just a US centric product, you know, we actually started in Asia. There's a lot of information coming through. And so now that we're global, it's putting that in and having direct comparisons and not having that subjective. It's just it's purely data and the data produces the results. Um, and that's really what people buy our product for. They don't want they now becoming less in, involved in uh, less uh, concerned about what we think they're using our data as another data platform, another right. data uh, source for them to actually make their own decisions. So is the, is the business model is like a subscription-based model? Is it so, I mean, if, if I'm BC firm or whatever, that I'm just going to subscribe to audit because I want to just kind of have this running real time, you know, information database for potential companies I want to invest in, or if I'm a corporate, like you said, you know, in m and space, I want to, I want to look at that. Is that, is that just kind of the basic business model is subscription? Yeah. So a, a couple of things that we've learned over the journey as well, but you know, it's, in short answer, yes and no. Yes, being there's people who use. There I am right in that percentage again. So yeah, no, I want to get a T-shirt that I'm 45 percent right. <laughs> <laughs> no, we try to be 99, but. Um, <laughs> We do sell a subscription service, but we also sell a data service. And a lot of our big customers will pull that data via APIs and CSVs mm-hmm. and so forth and add into their own system. And that's a lesson that we learned over the years where people are like, you know, I like your platform, but I, you know, but there's Chinese walls or other things mm-hmm. within the corporate business where we can't do it. So we need to pull that data in and put it in our own. So that's actually where a bulk of our business is, where people are using our data. Um, and implementing it on their, own, on their own services or even reselling that data with their own algorithms. So this yeah. is, you know, we're, we're feeding more data to people. Um, uh, similar to what a coin market cap will do with data. It has its own website, but also people use that data for their own particular websites and so forth. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the actual new platform that we launched was actually to get more customers involved and to give them some free access because, um, you know, a lot of people said, well, you're becoming too corporate. You know, we sort of miss that old, old consumer time where, you know, mm-hmm. we could log in and see what was going on in my startup. So we've added that function so people can see sort of a basic perspective of, you know, what Adobe does versus what we pr- produce for our corporates. See, you, you have that Silicon Valley, that reverse freemium model, you know, that you, we, we started out selling, now we're going to go free, now we're going to going to go back to the subscription base again. So yeah. It's... yeah. Well, we, we like to give things for free because honestly, customers help us, you know, give us direction on on you know what we're doing how we can improve mm-hmm. um you know and you know when we started it we were where we knew and then there was a heap of competitors and some competitors died off and now there's five or six of us that have been around for 10 years or so so we all know each other quite well um you know these are things that we learned to get better over time but one thing we've learned particularly from the pandemic is that you know 
we can't go in and sell something anymore because people aren't in the office. I mean, if you mm. just go to downtown San Francisco, it looks like yep. you know, the walking dead, there's no one yeah. there. <laughs> um, so it's really quite <laughs> creepy to be honest. Um, <laughs> and that's no joke. It's, it does feel like a walking dead. Um, but uh, the, uh, you know, the, we actually provide in that service so people can actually do it themselves where they're at their comfort of the home which is what i'm doing at the moment or if they're in the, you know the comfort of the bahamas or they're in you know cancun and enjoying it on a laptop and doing their work let, let them access all it up and the data from it up for whatever suits their purpose or their company's purpose so uh, this is a kind of an odd question no pun intended but how did you come up with the name <laughs> this is a great <laughs> question which i get asked a lot we actually bought the name um, in 2009 uh, when every single, so I bought a whole heap of domain names in 2009 when everything was pear-shaped and everything was going bad. And there was a website called, I think, Brandstack or something like that, where you could buy a logo and a domain name for 150 bucks. It was the best 150 I spent. But Odd Up was originally going to be private, so it was going to be like odds are up or odds are up on, you know, betting on startups, you know, what would work or not. That's now cryptocurrency in a nutshell, um, because, you know, that's what people do every single day on the yep. price of Bitcoin, Ethereum and other, other assets. But that was effectively it. And then the name was five letters and a dot com. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard to get. Um, everyone loves the name. Everyone remembers the name. So it was like odds are up. If you invest, odds are down, you know, it's just, and that just worked and it just stayed and stuck. And hence we, you know, became so simple and made, you know, three traffic lights of green, gold or red where people get the concept. And so the simplicity of it worked so well, we've kept up with it. So Otop was going to be a gaming website and then it's become a gaming on uh, effectively, you know, investing in startups in a different form. It is. It, it's a, it's an investor's game anyway. It, it's, it's just all like fake money. So yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, don't, don't tell the people. <laughs> I don't like that. They get very, very touchy. It's all monopoly money. So I'm a little curious, like what is, what's the advantage of uh, like, how do you onboard companies onto your platform? So how do you, you know, how do you get information about these companies? And, and I mean, is there a benefit to a company to be on your platform? Do you have companies that are approaching you to say, Hey, we want to be on auto. Um, we actually don't need to talk to companies and ask them anymore because companies have, I always say that people are very, unaware of how much they give out mm. and so this is a question sort of a two two edged question whereas you know how do you get the data and you know how do you how do you import companies people yep. are doing that every single day there's too much input coming into us being there's social media there's employees that talk about stuff on on you know on instagram or twitter yep. 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 and so all that information comes to us so we find that pretty quick linkedin helps us find where our person has have gone from where to there mm -hmm. and ultimately the tenure of time that they've been there and companies keep on pushing themselves out onto the internet we're actually trawling and try and grab all that stuff um, across the, uh, the, you know, the interwebs to actually hmm. pull that information out. And once, as coming back to your previous question, once we have enough information to put together a, a story as in what this company does, what their rating is, we, we put that out. We do have a lot of companies come up to us going, um, and they're very, 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 very early stages. And we typically yeah. say we get to a stage where we, you know, if you do these things and you automatically come in, you don't need to, you don't need to, you know, register your startup we used to register startups because we didn't have that technology at the right. time but now it's just it's pretty much the systems do what they need to do so um the short answer is no we don't even ask startups anymore um as soon as you put something on the internet it's it's out there um and so uh, uh if startups want to be more secretive and try the opposite approach not be or not up then don't put anything out they yeah. keep yourself in, you know, stealth mode and don't release anything out. We usually say that for companies who've got high value IP, i.e. Uh, medical companies or hardware companies that are producing something amazing. Um, uh, whereas opposed to now, when you've got blockchain companies, most of their code is on GitHub immediately. You mm. can actually put all this stuff together. You can, and you know, that's another thing we, we measure, you know, how, how much activity is on GitHub, you know, to, 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 to justify how, uh, strong a, a particular cryptocurrency is or a team in the cryptocurrency space and these companies i'm assuming like there's some kind of like a dashboard like that, that has their profile company profile or whatever on a on a set dashboard so you're you can kind of compare as you're just looking from company to company to company you can kind of compare them um and is is the does the platform allow you to do a comparison can you say okay i want to pick the best three 
you know, I, I want to look at, at their results side by side or whatever. You're kind of running a report of the top three cryptocurrencies or something against each other. What's, how, does the platform allow for that type of kind of manipulation of the data? Well, I mean, a lot of the data we pull out, we pull out so people can actually get that information so they can either you know, export it out to an Excel file or, yeah. or CSV. Um, we're actually launching the, the new components of that where people can add favorites to hmm. you know, their, their current uh, portfolio and then rank them accordingly, see if they've invested or not invested in um, and actually build their own dashboard. So you could build a dashboard as a salesperson, i.e. trying to find out you know, which companies are great for me to reach out to and then, you know, yep. uh, sort of similar to a CRM or versus an investor to go, okay, these are, this is my, uh, uh, you know, let's say I've got $100,000 I want to invest in and I want to invest in someone in the hardware space. These are 45 companies and based on my money, this is the type of valuation I'll get. This is potentially the equity I'll get out of that. So these are sort of things and tools that we're putting together from, from our platform. A lot of people do this already uh, with our data on their own platforms, but we're just actually making it easy for people to mm. sort of put that together as well. So all that stuff uh, is added to our new platform. A lot of the stuff we originally had was used, it wasn't used, it depended on the client. But as we're getting more um, of the B2C customers, mm -hmm. they're asking for these particular things yeah. and we're happy to put that together for them. Do you see that uh, your your clients are kind of, the, the use cases of the information on the platform is, I mean, do you see like interesting use cases? I mean, do you see them say, okay, actually I'm not investing, I, I'm, I'm trying to hire or I'm trying to, I'm, it's a sales organization, I'm looking for potential clients or I'm, mm -hmm. You know, looking for joint partners to, you know, to JV interest or something like that. Do you see that kind of tertiary activity as well outside of just the kind of the investor, I guess, analysis? I would say the investor analysis is now 10%. Everything else is the other 90. So what we originally- Hey, hey, my percentage is going up. Yeah, going up. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I like this as a percentage. Thing. Um, I'm a yellow light now. I'm not, I'm not red anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh, that's quite funny. Um, when, you know, as I said previously, as we originally built this for VCs, we thought they would be the only customers. When in yeah. fact, they're very few and far between. We actually have more people who are in the you know, the sales space, so Amazon's a customer, which will use that data to sell Amazon web services, or, you know, Bloomberg will use that data to, you know, that then gets set, uh, sent out to other companies who mm. then use it for hiring, or, you know, it's all sorts of different ways we use, to use the data. Yep. People actually yep. used it to, you know, find company, and uh, users have actually used it to find companies they're, at, they're hiring for. So a lot mm -hmm. of actually people do that right now that, you know, I'm going to look at up score as a, as a, as a consumer um, and someone who wants to work at a company, you know, what's their score? What's the risk? Because, you know, if you're going to join a startup in series AB, is there, you know, where the cracks, you know, you know, potentially in comparison to a, uh, a like-minded company, if I get my 10,000 shares of, um, you know, a dollar of share, and that potentially could be, you know, Ten million dollars over the next ten years. Yep. You know where yep. am I looking? You know what's the value, and that's actually been one of the biggest surprises in the last six months. More people are using it for that, so it's a hiring market, and people are smart. People are leaving the big corps because the mm -hmm. uh, like the large companies have already hit it, and so you get a different clientele. But the other, the other younger younger folk will tend to want to go to um, the pre IPO companies, particularly the Series B stage, where right. you know, everything's moving. There's stock, and you know this is the next big thing since sliced bread. And there does seem to be a lot of like overlap with kind of the idea of the net promoter score. You know the well, I mean, yeah, just I mean this, the the whole basis of you know the output at the end of of the analysis of, of startups. But I I want to really kind of drill down a little bit about just. You know, nobody just wakes up one day and says, oh, I'm going to be a data service for startups. I mean, what was, how did, how did you end up, you know, going from uh, being the manager at Domino's Pizza to, uh, you know, to being here or whatever? I'm being facetious, but I mean, what was the, what was the journey? If I, if I was a manager at Domino's Pizza, I probably would have ate most of it. So I'm <laughs> glad that I didn't do that because it's bigger than I am now. But I, I, I just, um, so when I left, uh, uh, banking, I, I was already investing in startups. I've been investing in startups for about 10, 10, 15 years and had great success. Um, but I, I'm, you know, the story, you know, story for me was I went to Hong Kong, uh, worked at JP Morgan, left JP Morgan, was already investing in making money as a startups, but Goldman offered me a role and I really wanted to work at Goldman. It was sort of like, you know, there's a company I want to work at was Goldman. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that I did. 
Um, but when I was at Goldman over the two, three, four years that I was there, I started getting itchy feet going, you know, this is sort of, is are these meetings of an hour worth my time? Are these 500 emails I'm getting day worth my time? <laughs> Um, and so then I started my uh, VC firm with my co-founder also, um, who joined Odd Up as well as uh, my co-founder as well. And as part of the, for the LPs, we'd, and I was in a research background at Goldman, I'd actually put research reports on why we were going to invest in a company before the LPs agreed to it. And a lot of the LPs were like, oh, this is great. I've just sent this to a friend of mine to see what you guys are doing. I'm like, well, okay. And then this sort of ballooned out. And so what happened, particularly because we'd started in Hong Kong or invested in Hong Kong companies, there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, sort of people around going, hey, this is good. And they were making decisions on them. I didn't get anything from that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I should have got 20 on that. Um, some of those companies all became billion dollar companies. And, wow. you know, we didn't invest in it, but everyone else <laughs> go record because we didn't have the mandate to because our LPs didn't. Um, but these, uh, but they became successful. And then people like, you know, actually there's a company out of this. You could actually build something from it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what? The VCs already returned, you know, three or four X its investment. Um, and I want to, you know, I want to sort of, be a founder again i want to get my hands dirty so odd up was born and then you know it, we grew really fast really really quickly mm -hmm. and that was a bit of a sort of whack you know like a bit of yeah. wind in the face here um and since then you know COVID has sort of calmed things down it's sort of more of a uh you know a much more smooth aligned process but at the start you know when we grabbed, built it it was based on an idea that people liked and would have actually pay for and that's exactly what happened so um i always tell other founders if you're you know, if you're going to try something, you know, don't like spend all this time building something and then go, actually, I don't really, no one actually wants this product. Build something and just do it to the kindness of your heart and then go from yep. there. It's a podcast, you know, you start building it slow as more people listen to it, then, you know, you've got something there and it sort of grows and it becomes its own business in itself. Yep. You know, that's, that's the journey of how I've got to where it is now, eight, nine years later. And so what, what is that describe the company? Like how many people, where are they located? You know, oh, what's wow. the, the this is fun part so the company quick overview yeah so the company is uh profitable which is always a good start um uh we got people in multiple locations around the world from hong kong to mumbai to the philippines to the us to australia to the uk um uh roughly around the world about 50 people around the world mm -hmm. um everyone remote at the I'm moment say almost there. yeah everyone, everyone probably remote. Is remote. yeah, yeah I, it's very few people now in in silicon valley purely because of um, not so, so much cost, but safety these days, yep. which is a really yep. weird thing to say. Yeah. Um, well, with all um, those zombies they, downtown, you know, uh, they will probably eat you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, to be honest, I'll get I'll get cancelled for that, but you know, it's it's true. So you don't know if you can get cancelled for the truth. Um, uh, but uh, yeah. So and so we've been growing at a uh, you know about 20 25 percent year on year in revenue. Mm, and wow. Um, you know we 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 grow slowly. I mean, with the year that we sort of were worried was 2020. I mean, when we uh, were sort of you know March 2020, we were like, oh crap, because you know companies were stopping the subscription. Everyone was panicking. It was COVID, and then guess what? Cryptocurrency took off, and you know it changed the way we saw it. And that was happened pretty quickly after. So. It was sort of, uh, you know, had had things gone down that bad rapid hole, I think we would have been a very different spot. But, mm. you know, thank you for the crypto bros that really, you know, and the companies that uh, bought us to sort of get to where we are. So it's been a, it's been a wonderful journey now. And I, I mean, even like with the great resignation, I mean, how many people left corporate and started something? You know, you, yeah. got, you got a whole new rash of startups that are you know, kind of jumping in the, the, the sphere here. But I, I, mean, I just love the just hearing founder stories because that's kind of the whole basis for the the podcast is it, it's just a platform to let founders share their startup stories. But I, I this is kind of my favorite part of the of the interview. It's just allowing the the founder guests to say, you know, here here's a couple of things that I wish I would have known when I founded this, when I co-founded this, whatever that would have been game changers today that I think are just pretty universal, you know, tenets that, that I think would really make a difference in, in people that are a little further behind me in the journey here, you know, so what are a couple of things that just really stand out to you that, you know, you think would be really germane and, and helpful, you know, hints for people to, that are, they're starting whatever, just kind of generically. So 
there's a couple of there's quite actually a few but i'll talk of the main ones the main ones is you know be careful the devil you dance with which was mm. something someone a founder in san francisco told me prior to raising capital um and that basically means that when you you know as you would you know some of these investors that you you have they're with you longer than most marriages that currently work in the US where, you know, they last longer than marriages in the US, I think, um, where you've, uh, you know, you're with an uh, investor for 10 years. And one, th one of the things that a lot of founders don't realize is what their mandate are. So I didn't ask questions of some of the investors. I was just at this time, like, we need money. We mm. need to keep on growing, blah, 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 blah. That's the things that you do at Series C, Series A, because you want to sort of, you, you're, on a, you're on a roll. You want to yep. keep on going. You've got impetus. Just make it happen. And so one of the things I failed to do is actually, you know, ask a lot of the, um, uh, you know, what their fund portfolio, what their what their strategy was, because that would have helped me then later in time deal with, you know, sort of the quirks that they have, because some of these funds have, you know, their own LPs and their requests. Yeah. Uh, the, the second thing was also, you know, focus on revenue. Focus on revenue. Don't spend money. I know it's really wonderful. And good thing about the pandemic is that you don't need a flashy office anymore. Just, you know, you can actually hire people from other parts of the world. They don't all need to be here in San Francisco. So, you know, focus on making money because having money and making revenue puts you in a completely different space there, you know, rather than, um, you know, raising capital and losing equity, you can actually take a loan because quite quite popular now people are taking you know uh, revenue loans um uh, because they do it they're actually high in revenue and then actually using that as sort of like a credit card in the books but at, at, in yep. a lower rate where you can actually expand pay that back and that all of a sudden you know when an exit comes you're not splitting it you know 80 percent for right. them and 20 percent for you it's 80 percent you and 20 percent for your investors and you're really taking you know you've worked hard to get there yeah. um hiring is the most important thing of every startup um, don't hire people because you're like, oh, please work for me. Um, hire people because they want to work for you and they feel they're in for that mission as well. Otherwise, you're just going to have problems. And one of the problems I remember from early on in Odd Up when we sort of finished Series A, we just went on a hiring spree and we found that there was so much, you know, you went from a company of eight to 10 people to a company of over nearly 100 people. There was mm. so much HR issues that... Yeah. That you had to deal with where you're like oh crap this is taking up 90 percent of my time transition I was, yeah yeah i want to spend 90 percent of my time selling and 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 building the product that's what yeah. i wanted to do and so that's also one of the things that's found and also know who yourself as a founder get mm. re get a really good co-founder that does everything that you don't want to do mm. um uh so you know i'm a good example with my myself and my co-founder my co-founder is exceptionally organized I'm exceptionally diligent, whereas I'm very high level, very much in the cell. I just want to focus on winning customers, building that story. Whereas, you know, she was very much around the, um, you know, let's help make sure we manage everything along the way. So mm -hmm. I know you're building a house, let's get the foundations. Yep. These things help as well. And then you find people within your team, you know, find people who want to build and make this successful. So, uh, you know, these are great learning lessons. And, um, the last thing I always tell founders is, is, you know, block the noise out because if you feel in your gut and your heart and your mind that this is the right thing to do, do it. It's going to be painful and you're going to go every day. What the hell am I doing? <laughs> what? Until you get to a stage where you go, okay, it's good. And then you get to a stage of going, this is too easy. I'm not expired that anymore, but you have the ability to inspire yourself, build something new, make the product that you want to do. Um, and so these are the really important things. I find that founders have that same problem over and over again, where they're, you know, they're just like oh, panicking about it, but, you know, reduce the noise, don't overcomplicate it, get back to the basics, get something simple. Um, take it like you're selling the sausage at a, a small barbecue, you know, you're, you're, or a hamburger. So you need to sell more hamburgers and then get creative with the amount of types of hamburgers at the moment just sell cheeseburgers that's all yep. you need to sell yep. then you get a double cheeseburger and then a you know a veggie <laughs> burger you know? so just start with the cheeseburger sell the cheeseburger get that doing well and you know, that's why in and out works so well you got like four burgers and it works and you don't have to overcomplicate. so hence yeah. why the easiest decisions are usually because they're simple they work and they can keep on repeating and that's why their drive through works because there's no decision fatigue that, you know, you're sitting there at the microphone trying to decide between 52 different options here. Yeah. We're in, we're out. We, we got it done. Yeah. So, 
I love it. I love it. I love it. I appreciate those, uh, those in our, we would call it the mentor moment, you know, and of the, of the podcast, but, uh, those are so, so apropos to, you know, to so many different, really to any industry, to any, any startup. I mean, what a, what great, great advice you gave there, but is there anything as we're kind of wrapping up today, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you, you think would be, you, know, you just want to kind of wrap up this tired, nice bow around it and, and uh, anything particularly that you would like to share that I haven't asked you about? Well, I, I mean, I tend to not want to oversell the company because I usually, when people ask, oh, tell me about your company, that's not what I'm about. You know, most of the, these, these uh, interviews I do is actually more for the founder. Um, and one of the things I've been having quite a lot of conversations with with founders is, you know, who should I have on my board? Who should mm. be my advisors? Um, I have found now with these years of doing this is actually other founders who are like two steps ahead. So if you're doing series A, you're looking to the series C or you're doing a C, C you do it at series B to help you along those journeys because they will save you time. Um, and so, you know, if there's anything I can pass to founders out there is, is that the most valuable asset is time. And the more time you waste, like wasting your time with a VC that's never going to pull the trigger. If you talk to other founders in the network, that's why a lot of people will go to a 500 or YC or a tech stars because that it's not necessarily the learning that you do. It's the network around where you can For send sure. a message saying, you know, tell me about this person. I've just been getting emails from her. And you can go, okay, is it worth my time or not worth the time? That's why I always tell founders, you know, your time is precious. If you're spending all your time chasing something that doesn't help add value to the business um uh then you know go back to the cheeseburger analogy mm. if you've got cheeseburgers that are getting sold um and you can keep on selling the cheeseburgers but someone over there is trying to sell you a, a huge office um and a beautiful uh drive through to sell them in but you can actually make more money just on your little store on a, a little um you know a food truck then you know be smart about your time and you know think about you know what's the right thing so talk to other founders try and find out exactly what you know what who you're dealing with works and if they've gone through the same problems and that will save you time and at the end you'll be going like oh that was quick and easy and you deal mm. with something that's not worth your time yeah. um, and I come back to where investors will ask you millions of questions waste heaps of months and then oh sorry you know we're not going to make that decision that is the worst 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 thing at all so you want a founder go oh yeah i dealt with them they wasted three months of my time mm -hmm. don't talk to them yeah and, okay. and they don't have a vested interest in in it like an investor yep. might so they don't care they just want agnostic make, yeah and the founder wants the other founder to to not deal with that because they hope that it pays forward so the founder that will do the same thing for them for sure for sure well, James, this has been a true pleasure to uh, chat with you today. Uh, man, I could just turn the recording off and just just listen to you, just kind of wax eloquent all you know the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> but uh, I know that you've got other things that you need to do. But the best place to find out more is just oddup.com. Yeah, and if if any founders want to reach out to me, James Jancotti is my Twitter account. I tend to you know, banter and talk crap and tell people exactly what the world is going to be like in the next couple of years. So, you know, take it's the sarcastic Australian in me that, you know, usually comes out, but I'm more than happy to talk to founders and help them out in their journey as well. So, because they've done it for me, I'll do the same thing for others. So you were really talking about yourself when you're talking about these investors getting on Twitter and trying to build their personal brand. Is that what is? <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't, I don't need social proof. I just need to, I, 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 I've learned that the best thing I can do is make fun of things because, you know, that's generally, you know, I'll cancel myself out one day and stop yet. <laughs> <laughs> I love it's it. coming not yet i love it uh, yeah the, this is a man with nothing to lose right here that's <laughs> exactly right he's made he's nothing to lose james thank you again for just taking time today and really just playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide have a great thank weekend you. really appreciate it another episode in the books we hope you heard some great takeaways don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review on itunes and youtube as always thanks for listening to rising tide